Hey everybody, this is Jason, and this is my first much anticipated video. So I would like to thank you all for your encouragement and support so far. It means the world to me, trust me it does. Um, never thought I'd find myself um, participating in this, but here we go. Um, I just wanted to give a brief history on uh, me and what I do, and also um, a few portions of my collection. This ring I bought when I was 16 years old, and I had to borrow the money from my dad. Uh, but I was a forward-thinking child, and I would say probably very odd, to say the least. Uh, still an odd adult, per se. Um, when I was supposed to be going to high school dances and mixers, I was asking to go to the um, shows at the malls, the antique shows, and I wasn't doing the things normal children did, um, but I acquired this ring, and this was kind of the start of my love of jewelry. Uh, it's Navajo, it's beautiful, oversized, and I still have it to this day, and I wear it an awful lot. Um, I just wanted to give you a couple highlights of things that were very notable from my collection. This ring was featured on the Antiques Roadshow in 2002 from Cleveland, Ohio. I was born and raised in Cleveland, and I moved to the Akron area to go to college at the University of Akron, where I hold two degrees in art, which is no major surprise. Um, I majored in metalsmithing, jewelry production, and I minored in photography. I was going to stay at the university to become a teacher, and I realized I just didn't have the patience for it. Um, so I, out of college, started working at a veterinary clinic, and I worked with James Noonan at Arlington Veterinary Clinic for 17 and a half years. Briefly after that, I worked at an antique mall out in Ravenna, Ohio, and then I opened up my own estate sale company and ran that for 15 years. And then I'll get into more current information after I discuss this ring that I'm holding. Um, hard to do two things at once. I know that you're here to see part of my collection. This ring was featured, like I said, on the Antiques Roadshow in 2002. It's from 1650 to 1680. It's crafted out of 14 karat gold, and it's a very tiny size ring. Um, it was made in France. And it was a compartment ring, and its only job was to hold a lock of hair of a, um, a, a mistress, per se, uh, whether it be uh, someone that was um, technically on the side in a relationship um, or more public um, in terms of a lover. There would be a lock of hair placed in the compartment, and then it would be kept a secret by lowering the Harlequin's face. Those are rose-cut diamond eyes and a Burma ruby mouth. One rosette is unfortunately missing on this side, can easily be replaced, but I thought, what a treasure to show you and share with you. Uh, I bought this on the third day of an estate sale, and all of the dealers had been through, and um, it was left over, and I acquired it for $20.50, or I believe it was $22.50. And when it was taken on the roadshow, Burge Zavian appraised it between, I believe it was between seven and 11000 And of course, the rumor here in my area where I lived at the time was that I sold the ring. Um, but you can't believe everything you hear, obviously. <laughs> I still own it. I still love it. Uh, and it sure is a treasure um, and just a beautiful, beautiful thing um, and perfect to share on Halloween. On to part of the collection that I'm not really well known for, but I have a great deal of. A lot of these items that I'm going to show you next were in an exhibition at an area museum here um, in Akron. And it was at the Hauer House Mansion, located by the University of Akron, where I went to school. And uh, these are earrings. Unfortunately, the earring wires are missing. They are Georgian. The reason why I'm showing them, and I'm so sorry about the reflection from these lights. I guess I could try and block it out, but it's not really going to work. Um, they're portraits, or I should say landscapes, on 
Mother of Pearl. They're mounted in 14 karat gold, which has oxidized over time because gold does oxidize. Um, and sorry about the dusty container, but apparently everything in my life is always under construction. <laughs> so there's always dust. Uh, me as a person, I'm always under construction, I should say. Uh, these uh, wire twist tassels are fantastic. Engraving on the back of the gold and the portraits, or I should say, again, the landscapes, um, are done out of dissolved human hair. So they are actually, um, I wish I could get closer up, but that's as good as we're going to get. And um, just absolutely beautiful. I was told to do this appropriately. I should have a ring light and I should have a tripod. And I don't have either. And I hardly ever do what I'm told. So um, next time for the next video, I will definitely be more prepared. But these earrings are um, Victorian. They're probably around 1860 would be the closest I would be able to approximate their age. But again, finding earrings of this age is, is very much so a challenge. Um, but they are beautiful, extraordinary examples of Victorian jewelry. Um, On to something that I personally used and wore for a few years. Um, when my black lab passed away, um, I was quite devastated. Um, I love my animals very much, and he was literally my best friend for 10 years of my life. And I needed something very important to keep part of him with me in that I could wear and enjoy. So I bought this pendant. Uh, it is Victorian. It is mourning jewelry. And on the back of it, let me wipe it because I just got my fingerprint all over it, um, is a lock of his fur. Um, and I put it underneath the glaze compartment so that I could keep a part of him and wear it. On the bottom is a Mississippi pearl uh, from the Miss Mississippi River. And in the center here is a European cut diamond. And it's approximately 80 points. Uh, so it's not a full carat. The rest of the pendant is mixed gold. It's rose gold and yellow gold and um, tracery enamel. And it was made around, it's, it's hard to date these, but it was made around 1855 to 1865. Um, it is not American. And I can't be sure of its origin because there is no hallmarks denoting where it was either manufactured or passed through and essayed. And it's on a very, very, very long original Victorian chain. Um, as other YouTubers have said and other historians, um, anytime you look at a clasp, don't assume that that's the original because it's not. That was replaced. It's brass. But the rest of the chain is 14 karat gold. Um, but just an extraordinary uh, morning jewelry pendant and nestled into a very old turn of the century box. Another pendant that I've loved for a very long time, which is highly unusual and something that is hardly ever seen, is this extraordinary, extraordinary pendant. Um, it is very, very, very large. And unfortunately, I don't think I'm going to be able to get it completely in the frame. Uh, but it has Persian turquoise, seed pearls, and angel skin coral. Um, and it's, it's an amazing thing because of its size and its age. Um, and I'm going to fight with this tassel to make it lay right. There is so much going on here. Uh, Recuerdo, um, you'll have to excuse my pronunciation, uh, is in of memory, basically. And then this compartment actually hinges off. So when you lift this up, this is spring-loaded and comes forward. And then this is the glazed compartment where you would keep hair of a loved one. So that completely opens and allows the woven hair to go in. I found this empty. Um, so it was never used um, to contain a lock of anyone's hair. Uh, but it is a Victorian mourning pendant. Um, beautifully executed and definitely quite museum grade when you think of it. Um, extraordinary piece. Again, date on this anywhere between 1870 and 1880. Um, when you get into circa dating, people have varying opinions. Um, but as a historian, that's as close as we're going to get. But beautifully done and wonderfully executed. And one of my favorites that, of course, is highly unusual to see. 
One of the pieces that was also in the museum show is this tiny portrait brooch. It is a painting on ivory. It's underneath glazed compartment. Um, it's circa 1830, dating by the lady's hairstyle. Uh, sorry for the animal fur, but that's the way it goes at Jason's house. That's what you get. Um, it is considered late Georgian, or shall we say mid-Georgian, to be correct. Uh, the painting is under beveled crystal, like I said. And, of course, there's a tiny fracture in the compartment. Didn't bother me one bit. Her face is beautiful. Um, the depiction is fantastic. Uh, and I've always loved her very much. Um, again, on the back, it would have a very simple C clasp. Um, on the very back of it, which you see there, is a very early clasp um, for uh, jewelry. And um, I inventoried these for the show just because I wanted to make sure that everything was identified and had didactics um, that were left with the items such as this. So when they were in the exhibition, they all had their information sheets with them. And unfortunately for the video, I didn't go through and match up all of them, but I have most of them matched up. So this is the next one. It's carved out of Whitby Jet. And it would be circa 1850 to 1860. Um, it is carved out of jet, which is essentially fossilized coal. It's no longer mined, and it only came from one place, which was a cliff in England. And um, it wasn't allowed to be mined because um, it basically threatened um, the whole town, um, supposedly, that sat up on top of a cliff. So it's fossilized coal. It's beautifully done, highly polished. Um, fully articulated, so there's um, totally lots of open areas, and um, beautifully done. Reverse carve from the back, and then um, it's got three flowers, and it would be basically the second phase of mourning, because it was not only matte finished, but also shiny as well. So that would be considered second phase of mourning in terms of their rules and regulations in the Victorian time period. I'm by no means an expert on those rules and regulations, um, but I know a little bit about it. Uh, this is a mid-Victorian vulcanite necklace, and it is um, a pressed cameo. She is not carved, so she was pressed in a mold and then laminated to the surface of another piece of vulcanite. Um, beautifully done. Absolutely wonderful. And then this large, large, large curb link chain with a gold filled clasp. So that is the original slot clasp on the back of the necklace. And then it's a rare survivor because the thinness of these links um, and also the fact that they were seamed, some of them were seamed together. It's just a very, 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 very large, very large style link chain. Um, again, Victorian, right around 1870 to 1880 would be the approximate time period for that piece. Um, and again, keeping with the mourning customs of losing a loved one and having to wear colors um, that were black. Um, or I should say, not being allowed to wear colors and being only allowed to wear black. Um, this is a gutta percha cameo of two deers. It is made right around 1860 to 1865. Note the intricacy of the carving on this one. Some of this was pressed and molded and then worked by hand. So it was not only pressed and molded, but then worked by hand. It is set in a low carat gold frame. So it'd be around nine carat gold. And um, gutta percha was made from the sap of the Malayan trees. And then it was gone through a vulcanization process to be put together and to be made into what we now consider a plastic. Um, here is a beautiful cross. Um, I don't get into very much of owning certain materials, and this is one of them. Um, it is a natural material. I will say that. Uh, extremely oversized. It was a gift. Um, through a client that I had worked for and done an estate sale for. They did not want to sell this because of what it was made out of. So I graciously added it to my collection. And as an animal advocate, um, I felt uh, as though the damage had already been done. 
uh, to the animal and um, forgiveness um, needed to be bestowed upon this piece so that it wasn't lost um, for good. This cross is very, very large. It's over four and a half inches across. And notice the extremely fine carving, all of the open work behind the cross, and all of the forget-me-nots, or um, they could be Lily of the Valley. Um, beautifully done, beautifully executed. Definitely not American, so had to have come over from England at the time. But a beautiful piece and something that I now um, keep safe. Um, an interesting piece and perfect timing for Halloween were the rare and very haunting lover's eye brooches. So this is what would be considered a lover's eye. It's unusual because most are paintings or watercolors on ivory. This one is a charcoal drawing on paper. Um, it is mounted in a gold filled frame and the frame itself has wheat, uh, which is a symbol of growth. Um, it's uh, just a beautiful piece, and the compartment on the back has a photograph of a gentleman. I'm not sure if it would be his eye on the front, or if, in fact, if it was the eye of someone that he was leaving, such as his wife. But it's a beautiful thing, um, and such brooches have continued to go up in value, and I love them very, very much. And that was part of the exhibition as well. Um, on to a very small brooch that was forgotten about at a pawn shop. Um, some people, where do I sort? Well, you know, where do I source things, or where do things come from? Um, I don't really consider it sourcing things. I consider it the fact that, like a moth to a flame, some things will just find you. This was one of them. I went to a pawn shop, and they had just gotten in a box, and they were sorting the find from the costume jewelry, and they put this tiny little brooch in with the costume, um, and I was very quick to rescue it, per se. Um, this brooch is genuine coral, and then there's a glazed compartment in the center, and underneath it is braided hair, and then the gold frame surrounds that. On the back, someone might question the age, because this is technically called a tube hinge, and this tube hinge has the pin stem soldered onto it. Over here, we have a rollover clasp, but that, that was definitely a later repair. You could see by the lead solder. And uh, that would have been just a C, just a little um, C with no mechanism whatsoever. And this brooch dates to around 1810 to 1830. That's as close as we're going to be able to get. And uh, I wish I could give more information on that one, but I do not know anything else about it. Um, on to um, a necklace that, again, has been packed up for a very long time. Um, this is also Whitby Jet. Um, and it is so beautiful. Um, once again, a morning piece that has been with me for a long time. Uh, I was sold at a yard sale as plastic, and um, definitely not just plastic, definitely something that um, is much better than plastic. Um, Whitby Jet, again, mined in England, and this necklace would have been right around 1850 to 1860. Um, this is not the original ribbon. Uh, the ribbon has been replaced. And unfortunately, it is missing two drops on either side because there are empty holes. But again, as a historian, we expect things to not be 100% perfect um, when we find them and they're of that age. When we do find them whole, it's a wonderful situation, um, but it sometimes just doesn't happen that way. This is one of my favorite pieces. It's an extremely rare hair work painting under glass. Um, the background is in fact mother of pearl. And then um, the little tiny flowers are cut out of human hair, paste together, and then assembled as a flower bouquet. Interestingly, I wasn't really sure that this was a mourning piece. Yes, it has black enamel around the outside. It is mounted in 14 karat gold. But then on the reverse, um, it it says your, and then it says good friends. So I'm not really sure if this was exactly used as a memorial to someone that was lost, or if it was a sentimental piece to show love of someone that um, was distant. Um, the seed pearls in the center of the flowers 
again, it's debatable. And if they have a meaning, if they do mean that they are tears, or if it's just a, an artist using them um, as a design element. So because I wasn't there over, you know, well over 140 years ago, um, I can't say for sure. Um, but it is one of the most beautiful things I have seen and such an incredible, incredible work of art and just extraordinary. Once again, there's the didactic uh, that was used at the exhibition. Um, each thing was um, mounted in the showcase, just wonderful. I, I spent a long time on that exhibit. Um, another one that I guess I'd like to talk about just because a lot of people are confused, um, about, um, glass or jet, um, or how things are constructed. And this one is another morning necklace. Um, it is complete. Um, it is absolutely beautiful. And, um, if I can lay it down here, sorry, I'm not really used to all this, um, but I'm trying my best here. Um, this is just absolutely beautiful. It is black glass, which is considered French jet. Um, it is not jet at all. Um, it's actually glass. And um, each little stone, per se, is hand faceted. And then it is applied to a steel sheet. So on the back of each is steel. And then it's been japaned or colored black to, um, you know, further the aspect that um, anything besides black was really not allowed to be worn when someone was in mourning. And this piece would be around 1860 to 1870. Again, not American, uh, would have come over from England um, at the time. And then... Um, I have so many more in this box, uh, and I'm trying so hard to stay focused, but um, I'm so passionate about my collections, and um, I get very easily distracted. Um, this is a woven hair watch chain with gold mounts, circa 1840 to 1850. Um, we see a lot of these in our business and in our industry, um, but this one is, is just absolutely a stunner. Um, it's just absolutely beautiful. Um, again, the mountings are gold filled and uh, just really beautiful. Um, and the intricacy of the woven hair is extraordinary. It's over an inch wide. Um, it's in very perfect condition. Um, and again, was in the exhibition. That chain itself, being a watch chain, its only job was to contain a pocket watch, and more than likely, it was um, worn by a man. And that would be around 1855 to 1865 on that particular chain. Um, a few other pieces before I start to close this down and have my first major accomplishment with getting a video up. Um, there's so many more in this box, and I'm trying so hard to stay focused. Um, I guess I should share at least some of another collection that I'm known for is my antique buttons. Um, and these are on a card that was displayed. Sorry, I can't display the whole card at one moment. These were patented in 1851. The patent was applied for by Goodyear, and these are all Goodyear buttons. And on the back of each, the the back mark says 1851, and these, in fact, were not made in 1851, but they were made between 1853 and 1872 by the Goodyear Rubber Company based out of Ohio. And why I included these is because I have a very large collection of clothing buttons because uh, that is, it's basically jewelry for your clothes. And I have a collection that I'll be willing to share just a few more pieces before I go. Um, this was one of my major accomplishments from an antique show that was in Burton, Ohio. Um, I get into a lot of things that are just absolutely beautiful, and this is one of them. Nestled in its original box, this fantastic bracelet is not only oversized, but boy, is she a beauty. It's an original painting on ivory, of a very young woman that I'm sure had unfortunately passed at a very early age. Um, it is 14 karat solid gold. It's a very, very oversized link. 
uh, hidden clasp on the back. Safety chain had unfortunately been repaired, but we do forgive that. Um, and then it opens this way, it goes on, and then it closes. There is a compartment underneath the central portion here. It is signed the person's name on the back. I've not done any sort of research, but I will, of course. It is missing a small rosette on the left-hand side. But again, I forgive that much like the compartment ring earlier. Um, it's just a beautiful piece. And um, I love her very much. Um, it was from an antique dealer who labeled it gold filled um, and sold it as gold filled. It was still extremely expensive because it is in its original box. I'll try and back out here for a second um, just to show you the box. And let's see here. I'll zoom back in for a second. Sorry about that. Um, but that's the box that it's in. And then it does have um, the little hasp hinges on the side. On the inside, I didn't quite understand why the dealer thought that it was gold filled because it's clearly marked David Rate, Goldsmith, Broadway, and New York, uh, manufactured upon um, the premises. So it was actually made stateside. And why would someone think it's gold filled when it's clearly labeled that this fellow was an accomplished goldsmith in New York. So we'll close that up and I will show you just a few other pieces. This is one of my favorites from my collection and I'm kind of breaking the rules on Victorian morning jewelry and Halloween by sharing this tiny little dog. But I found him in my stuff yesterday and I just felt as though I had to show him. Um, I've loved this little dog for so many years. It's rose cut diamonds and a tiny little garnet eye. It looks like a ruby, but um, it is in fact a garnet. This little guy is so well modeled and so well formed. Much like the antique jewelry that we see, it is silver topped gold. So they used sterling silver where they put the diamonds and then the back of the brooch is solid 14 karat gold. Again, we have a tube clasp right here and we have a simple C rollover. This brooch would have been made right around 1865, maybe 1875, definitely considered Victorian, but the little rose cut diamonds are absolutely fantastic. And he's so well made that he actually stands like a little sculpture. Um, sorry about my box being so dirty again, but you know, you get what you get with me. Um, and I just absolutely love him. I think he's great. Um, I've been questioned um, by a few people because they know that I'm a metalsmith. So staying with the mindset of compartments, this ring has been worn by me for many, many, many years. Um, this again was a compartment ring that I produced. Um, yes, I wore it for probably the last 20 years of my life. Um, oxidation, dirty, scratched up, don't really care. Uh, because that's its history. It's my dog's fur underneath a glazed compartment. I made the sterling silver mounting. I made the compartment when he passed away, took a trimming of his fur, and I proudly wore it. Um, and I had a piece of him with me. I did seal it so that no water would get inside. And then I bezel set the crystal. So um, it's completely bezel set. And then when um, my Bull Terrier passed away, his name was Zito. He was an amazing dog, a rescue from Indiana. I made this compartment ring. I wanted an eternity band, so I turned that into the shank. I soldered it together. Um, the rings mean something I don't really get into, um, but uh, it is completely hand fabricated. And then I used a Czechoslovakian um, glass rhinestone from the 20s as the compartment, but you can see the fur underneath there. He was all white. Uh, he was a white bull terrier, much like the target dog, um, and I absolutely loved him, so I was able to keep a part of him with me as well. Um, a ring that I just wanted to show because I wanted to. Um, I was told that you can't make a ring out of tubing, that it would be physically impossible. So I decided to challenge everybody and I hand fabricated this out of sterling silver and it is solid sterling silver and uh, it is fantastic. It's a wearable sculpture. Uh, let me trade out this ring and take this off, get my ring off and show you that it actually works as a ring and it is wild and crazy just like me. It's absolutely nuts. 
And of course, there's dog fur on it. Um, and on to the last piece I'd like to share that I actually created is a Art Nouveau inspired necklace. Um, for years, I tried to find an original of these and it was virtually impossible, even for any amount of money. Um, and I had an old razor blade that the handle was broken and it was made out of celluloid, which is this center portion. It was Venus standing on a clamshell. So I cut her out with a jeweler saw. I cut out the wings. I cut out the vines. I set all of the little tiny um, shell stones. I created the whole thing by hand. Nothing is cast. I used an antique um, angel skin coral drop um, to accentuate the authenticity, if you will, of the piece, even though I would never sell it as old. Then I used a paper clip, um, three plus one chain, two very early turquoise beads, and this central medallion I, I pierced out by hand as well. Um, this necklace took me approximately three days to make start to finish. Um, and I just think it came out beautiful. Um, and I used to wear it all the time. Um, I'm a purist when it comes to oxidation. I don't clean my silver. I'm very much so against cleaning silver. That's just my personal preference. Um, and over time, I'll explain why. Uh, this concludes my first video. I don't know how I made it, 31 minutes. Um, I'm sure probably no one wanted to listen to it. I'm just kidding. Um, I had so much fun. Um, hopefully you enjoyed this. If you have any requests at all from me, would you please put it in the comment section so that I can make further videos that would interest you? Um, I'm only doing this to educate and entertain. Um, customarily, I'm not so uh, monotone or stuffy, but this is my first attempt and I just really appreciate your time. So thank you so much. Happy Halloween, everybody. Stay tuned for more videos. Thank you again so much. Bye.